welcome to Harnessing the Power of the Restart. And for those of you who are not on mute, if you could kindly go on mute, that would be absolutely fantastic. Please do not feel any obligation to have your camera on. How often do you hear that these days, right? Um, Turn it off, enjoy a cup of coffee, do whatever you need to do. That's going to be fine. I am here today to share some information with you that you can use as we head back to the office with this restart. So uh, don't feel any obligation at all. We are going to use Menti, menti menti.com. And I am going to ask you to access Menti either on your phone or open a second browser window. So while we're figuring all that out and you'll be getting links in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jan Griffiths. I am the president and founder of Gravitas Detroit. And I am indeed that rebellious passionate farmer's daughter from Wales. And for those of you who might think, huh, that sounds familiar, you'd be exactly right. That's part of the intro in our Finding Gravitas podcast. I've spent over 30 years, actually 35 years in the corporate world, mostly in the procurement and supply chain related functions, but also in manufacturing, in sales, Um, and in program management, mostly automotive, little bit of appliance industry thrown in there. And I achieved my dream job. I achieved the position of being a chief procurement officer for a major $3 billion tier one company. And I joined the ranks of the top 100 leading women in automotive and everything was great, right? I'd achieved my dreams. Everything was fantastic. No, I felt as though I was trying to fit a mold all those years in the corporate world. And I thought, you know what, why can't I just be myself? Why can't I lead in a more authentic way? That's what I really wanted to do. So I quit my job. I took my income, my salary to zero, zero overnight and started my own business, Gravitas Detroit. And uh, we've been in business for just over two years. And my mission is to transform the work experience and break the mold of corporate leadership. I don't think as leaders, we should ever have to feel like we've got to fit somebody else's mold. I am not into fitting molds. I am not into cookie cutter approaches. And I am not into people telling me the way that they think it should be. I believe we should all lead in an authentic way, bring our true authentic selves to work and lead our teams that way. But that can be problematic in itself. But that's enough about me. So I'd like you to jump on Menti. If you uh, can access the link, you can do it on your phone. Either click on the link or if you type in menti.com and put the code in, because you'll see the slides on Menti. You won't see the slides on Zoom. And I'll be asking you a couple of questions. So let's go ahead and take a look at Menti. I'm going to ask you the first question. It's really hard. So pay attention. How are you feeling? How are you feeling today? Are you beyond excited? I'm beyond excited. Are you fantastic? Are you just okay? Or are you miserable? What, how are you feeling? Come on. I cannot tell where the responses are coming from. So it's completely anonymous. I only can see how many people are responding. So don't have any concerns about people, you know, seeing, you know, if you are miserable, say you're miserable. It's okay. It's about authentic leadership. It's about being authentic. Say it. If you're beyond excited, say beyond excited. That's what I'm feeling today. Okay, come on, let's get a couple more responses in there. We got a lot of people feeling fantastic because isn't that what it's all about? Isn't that what leadership is all about? It's about making people feel good, feel great about what there is, what it is they're doing and to feel great about your leadership. And I believe that there is power in this idea of a restart. And we are right here, right now, where we're facing a great opportunity for a restart. This is a great opportunity for authentic leadership 
to come front and center. I, I'm particularly inspired by Mary Barra. Those of you who are in the automotive industry, of course, will know Mary. And she came up um, several years ago with this idea for the dress code that was dress appropriately. And that was challenging because General Motors is so used to having pages and pages of structure and policies and procedures and documents. And to have to deal with this dress appropriately was mind blowing for some people. And now she's followed that thought process with work appropriately. And she believes that it's up to leaders to focus on the work on, and not on the where. Well, that sounds great, right? But the reality to that is something quite different. And I will tell you, you know, from my experience in many different leadership roles in different industries, dealing with different cultures, I love it. I love the idea that it's very empowering that as a leader, I get to figure out what's best for my team. But yet we all try to go back to this, to look for the policy and procedure, right? We're all struggling with, well, what does that mean? Does that mean three days a week I work from home or do I just come in for team meetings? And the answer is, yeah, it's all of that. There is no perfect structure. It is up to the leader of a business, a function or a team to do what they believe is right in collaboration with the team to get that work structure set up the right way. So don't look for any perfect answer. There isn't one. What there is, is an opportunity for your authentic leadership to shine through in this moment and to not be concerned about what others are doing. And this, I believe, will be a big challenge. If we take a large company, for example, we all know this, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, you're going to have people who are all into the, you know, let's get back into command and control. Let's get people back in the office where I can see them, where I can focus on them and, and implement command and control. And then you're going to have people the other end of the spectrum who are going to be, hey, I trust my team. Everybody's working from home all the time. And then you'll have people who are in the middle. And all these leaders could be in the same company. So it's really going to come down to the executive team, the senior leadership to model the behavior that they want to see and to provide some guidelines. Because I can just see it now, right? If you're somebody who's working for a leader who's command and control, you're going to be saying, well, why can't, why can't I work from home more days a week? Why that team's doing it over there. So that's going to be really interesting when I have all these questions coming up. Lots of challenges out there. But I want to know from you, with this idea of the hybrid team, uh, working from home, flexibility, particularly with Mary Barra's approach, work appropriately, what sort of challenges do you see with this approach? Please put your answer into Menti, and we can all see the answers as they build on the screen. And I can't see where these are coming from, so don't be shy. Just type it in and hit submit. What are some of the challenges that you see with work appropriately? Because I, I see most companies are, are taking a version of that. They might not have coined it in those two words perfectly. But a lot of companies are saying, yep, we're going to have a hybrid work model. We're not sure what it is yet or how we're going to figure it out. But that's what we're going to do. But what are the challenges with work appropriately? Okay, we got the first one up, communication. What else? Inconsistencies and in approach. Yes, yes. Not everyone has the same work ethic. Yes, yes. Inconsistency with leadership. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. Come on, what else? What else have we got? What challenges have we got out there? Lack of trust. Oh, yes. My favorite. Difficult for new employees to absorb the culture without seeing it. Lack of teamwork. Better definition, some teams will be in person full time, might hold a grudge against those at home. Absolutely, yes. This is great stuff. 
And you'll get copies of, of all of this at the end of the, um, I'm sorry, tomorrow, you'll, you'll get copies of all the mentee responses. Yes, you're absolutely right. Meeting KPIs. Okay. A lot of the things that I see coming up on the screen are indeed things that existed before the pandemic. So these are things that we deal with in leadership in general. This is about authentic leadership. This is about coming forward as an authentic leader, doing what you believe is right for your team. And it is true that there will be leaders around you, maybe at the same level, above you, below you, who might have a different approach. But this is your time. And I believe that if you're in this webinar today, there's something about me that resonates with you. So there's something in you that believes in authentic leadership. And this is the time for authentic leadership to shine through and for you to do this the way that you believe is the right way to do it. So you mentioned communication. Figure it out as a team. Sit down and talk about it. What, what meetings should be done in person? How should you collaborate? When should you be in the office? When can you work offsite? And remember, every single person is a different individual and has a different need and requirement. Through all of my experience in the corporate world, we always had a policy, right? There was always a policy for this and a policy for that. And I was always the leader who was judged mercilessly by my peers because I gave my team, in their mind, too much flexibility. And that's you're still going to have that. That's still going to exist. But I believe that you focus on you, your leadership, and your team. You can't control what other people think or feel. You can only do what's right. There is no cookie cutter approach anymore to this. You will have to get the strength to lead the way that you want to lead. Absolutely. So let's take a look at our next slide, which will talk about why now is such a great time to make this change. And remember, my mission is to transform the work experience and break the mold of corporate leadership that we've all been suffering with for decades. Maybe some of us, not so much, not so much as others, but th this is the time. There is science out there, and I will cite the article that I've been researching lately. And basically, they say that the perfect time for change is when we when we have when we establish what they call a temporal landmark so temporal landmarks spur goal initiation when they signal new beginnings on the start of new time periods so think about this right and this is from uh hang shang dai and katie milkman katie milkman just wrote a book about change that's absolutely fascinating so we create these temporal landmarks in our mind. We say, oh, you know what? I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to do that tomorrow. That's a temporal landmark because you're distancing yourself from the day. You're putting your past behind you and you're saying tomorrow is going to be better. Tom Next month will be better. Next week will be better. I'll start that on Monday. So tell me when in your life have you experienced a new start that's given you this opportunity to put distance between the past, what's happened in the past, and establish something new. For me, it was uh, starting a new job has always been exciting for me because that's a time for me to sort of reassess who I am, where my leadership skills are, and start again. So let's jump to Menti. Please tell me, give me an example of where you feel a restart where you put this temporal landmark in your, in your mind. It could be as simple as a Monday. You know, Mondays, I'm always stronger on Mondays. I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I'm much better on Mondays. I'm very focused. I know what I want to do. And then I sort of drift towards the end of the week. So Monday is an example, you know, a new job and then New Year. Perfect, right? We, new Year's resolutions. We all say, yes, that's the classic example of a temporal landmark. Also, there are religious holidays out there that we might use to establish a temporal landmark. So this is an example of why this restart, this coming back to the office is a temporal landmark. 
And we have to identify it as so. We have to identify it as a new beginning. Because if we lose this opportunity and go back to the office and say, well, you know, I just want things to get back the way they were. Oh, no, please don't do this. This is a great opportunity to move the leadership, the authentic leadership agenda forward for you to come forward with your leadership skills and lead the team the way that you want to lead the team. Yeah, new month, new quarter, right? Oh, when I can do it this quarter, we'll do it next quarter. Okay, right, let's, let's move on. So that's an example of the restart. And uh, if, if you're interested in more of the science behind it, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and we can talk about it. Okay, so let's go to the next Menti slide, please. I love this slide because this is it, right? This is, this is the time to break the chains of the corporate leadership mold as we know it and move forward. So I, I would hope that by this point, I've explained to you the why now is the time for the restart. But let's talk about the how. So what do we do, right? What do we do? How do we do this? Well, I'm going to share with you seven leadership strategies. And again, this is not a cookie cutter approach. This is not some, you know, leadership program that follows a predetermined agenda. This is a culmination of my experience of 35 years in the corporate world, plus just over two years as an entrepreneur working with teams and workshops and leadership interviewing some of the finest authentic leadership minds of the planet in my podcast. This is a culmination of all of these things coming together. And I call them leadership strategies because you can look at these things and I'll, I'll walk through each one of them and say, okay, well, that's just one thing that you're going to do. A strategy implies that it's more longer term. This, I'm going to give you ideas, things that you can do right away, but things that you'll have to keep thinking about longer term and longer term. And it will become part of your leadership tools, part of your arsenal of leadership tools that you have. And uh, I think I'm going to start. Yeah, let's just start right in on the seven leadership strategies. So here we go. And I like to keep things simple, right? So you'll see very simple, straightforward relatable words. I'm not into corporate speak anymore. I used to be, I can do it really well, but I don't like it. I like to use words that people can relate to. So let's start off. Number one, connection. Back to the office. Look at that. That's actually it is the office, the show. I don't know about you, but I binge watched that during the pandemic, maybe more than once. So let's talk about connection. We've missed it. Why do we, why do many of us love the office? We love the, the, the show, right? Why is that? We, we love the connection that we have with people. We're human beings. We crave it. Now, when we were in our traditional office environment, it just sort of happened, right? We had water cooler conversations. We had conversations before and after meetings. The in-between time, I would argue that more decisions were made in those in-between times in meetings than they were actually in the boardroom and in the conference room. We, we build trust with people. We build relationships. New people who are coming into the organization, if they've come in during the pandemic, they haven't had a chance to really you know, feel that and make those connections. Here's the thing about why this is a strategy, because it has to be intentional. Now, no longer can you just have, say, one team building exercise a year or one offsite a year or two offsites a year. No, you have to be very, very intentional about how to connect people together because you're going to have some people working from home, maybe full time, maybe some people in different countries. Everybody's going to have a different kind of work setup and you have to figure out a way to bring the team together to build that strong foundation. High performance teams only come from building a strong foundation. So be intentional. When we run this in the Gravitas workshop, what we normally do is we do something simple. We ask our participants to come to the table with a visual that explains something that they did for fun, or something that they learned new in the pandemic. What was it? Um, you know, and, and just show us a picture. 
just something very personal. It, it just, there's so many different things that you can do to make this happen, but you have to be intentional. In addition to the lunch, a breakfast, um, a t- maybe a team building exercise where you build something. And I know some of you are probably out there rolling your eyes going, oh, really? Not that team stuff again. I know that in particularly in automotive, sometimes we talk about that team stuff as being soft and we see that as a weakness. It is not a weakness. It is a strength. You are building a foundation for a high performance team. It takes time. It takes energy. And you have to be very intentional about it. So number one is connection. Don't just assume it's going to happen. Be intentional. Okay, number two, get it off your chest. See, I told you I like to keep things simple. There's a lot of things that have happened. Remember, we've created this temporal landmark now with this new start, right? So get it off your chest. There's a lot of things that are going on in the workplace, even before the pandemic, that people don't want to talk about because they, they're afraid of being judged. They're afraid that they're going to upset people. Everybody wants to be liked. So it's really important to clear all that baggage out of the way and give people the space to get it off their chest. When we run this in the workshop, obviously I facilitate it. You do need a, an experienced person to handle this, get it off your chest. Some of the things that I do quite simply is I have people write it down on post-it notes about processes or behaviors or things that have been bugging them that slow the business down, that maybe create a toxic work, work culture. And then I put people into groups and we, we review the post-its. It's, it's not rocket science, but you have to give people the space. And as a leader, you have to make sure that they feel safe. And psychological safety, let's go back to Google Project Aristotle. Psychological safety is the number one trait of a high performance team. After all the studies that they did, So as a leader, giving people this safe space. And you do that with your behaviors and your actions. You can't just say, this is a safe space. Tell me what you think. You know, it doesn't work that way because maybe they're dealing with decades of baggage, decades of fear. So that's going to take a little bit of time. But this is a great exercise to run. Get it off your chest. And then you've created, you've gotten it, got the bad stuff out of the way. Now you can, now you can start to focus on the good stuff. You can't jump into the good stuff until you clear the way. All right. The next one, number three, is what we love. So what, as a leader and a team, what did you absolutely love about the way you worked pre-pandemic and during the pandemic? So many leaders have told me, that they love the way that they were able to communicate with people, have meetings, uh, board meetings that involved global members, uh, much easier, they were easier to schedule doing them virtually than they were trying to get everybody from around the world into a conference room. Things like uh, we were able to get purchase orders approved in three steps instead of 30. Whoa, as an ex-purchasing person, that's kind of scary. But people have loved that. There's been lots of great things that have happened. Um, what about, you know, the, the way people have been ha- behaved, right? Hey, I love the way you threw your heart and soul into uh, providing meals for people who were suffering during the pandemic time. I mean, there's lots of things that we love that you want to hold on to in your culture. Culture. Whoa, wait a minute. Where's that? Where'd that word come from? The culture word, the culture word, culture is simply this, is how things really get done. There's the policies and procedures, and then there's the how we think it should get done, and then there's the how things really get done. So what you're doing as a leader right now is you're getting into that, the the dirt and the detail about how things really get done. So the good stuff you want to hold on to. Again, I would use the same approach, just like the post-it notes, put them uh, into groups, put your teams into smaller groups and have them report out and talk about what it is they absolutely love. Now, let's go to number four. Number four, strengths. I love this. I love running these workshops around strengths. 
so often in the corporate world, I, some of you on the call will remember this, you know, it was like, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? And then we switched to opportunities because we thought that sounded better. Yeah, guess what? We didn't fool anybody, right? What is this strengths and opportunities thing? Um, now, to be clear, there's a difference between talking about strengths and opportunities and development needs. Good leaders are coaches and they work with people on their development needs to help them achieve their goals. That's different. But when you talk about strengths in weaknesses or opportunities, I, I'll give you an example, right? I, I don't like analysis in finance. People think that's crazy given my past position in supply chain, but I don't like it. I never have liked it. I don't like crunching numbers. I will never like crunching numbers. Ever. It's not going to happen. You can give me all the training in the world. It's just not who I am. So why am I spending time working on this when what I should be doing is just leveraging and understanding and amplifying my strengths and then figuring out how these strengths of each individual come together so that you get that multiplier effect to create that high performance team that we so richly deserve. Every leader deserves to have that team, but getting it, ah, that's a little tricky. So in this exercise, and this can get quite emotional, when we work with strengths, uh, sometimes when I go really deep into this, we use Clifton Strengths Finder because that gives you a nice uh, framework for understanding people's strengths. But I ask people to go into smaller groups and talk about the people on their team. They're not allowed to talk about opportunities or weaknesses, just strengths, and uh, two, two, two strengths, two different um, ideas of strengths. One would be a technical strength, a skill set within the workplace, and the other would be behavioral. So one could say, ah, hey, I love the way you're, you can uh, analyze a P&L. You know, I lo love the way you can do that. Another one, a more a behavioral one would be, you know what, you're really great at handling the customer. The way that you maneuver through those conversations and handle that, so two things, there's a technical strength, a, a skill set, and then there's a behavioral strength. So uh, what I find is that when, when people talk to their teammates about their strengths, which they very rarely do, again, as a leader, you're giving them space to do this. It gets quite emotional. Um, I ran this at a workshop in December, and I remember seeing one woman, she was almost in tears. She said, I, 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 I didn't realize, I, I guess I, I sort of knew that was a strength, but I didn't realize that my team members uh, thought that of me and respected me that much. It's so powerful. Again, making time, being very intentional about talking about strengths. Okay, let's go to the next one. Number five, trust battery, trust. Ooh, what is trust? What is trust? Trust is a feeling. It's very hard to define and you know it, right? You know when you meet somebody and you trust them and you meet somebody that you don't. Think about this. Think about, and I'm not going to ask you to put this in the chat or anything, but think about somebody that you trust that you work with. Think about that communication process right now. It's easy, right? Because you trust them. You probably can just either send them a text or a quick email or pick up the phone. Um, you can get right to the point. You don't really have to think too much about how they're going to interpret it. What do they think? You know, um, are they going to take the wrong way? You don't have to worry about that because the trust is there. Then think about somebody that you don't have trust with. And what does that communication process look like? I bet you send them something. I bet you issue one of those emails where you copy 15 people, right? Maybe you do that. I don't know. But it's a totally different process and it doesn't feel good. Whenever you're communicating with somebody you don't trust, it's like, oh, I don't even want to talk to this person. We have to be intentional. We have to take an action to build a bridge with somebody we don't trust. And I know you're probably thinking, well, well why, would, why should I have to do that? Why can't it be them? If everybody thinks that, it's never going to happen. We've got to build the trust battery with individuals and as teams with other functions. And this gets a bit tricky to do with your team because obviously you're getting into some sensitive areas. So I would just advise you to, when you're talking about building trust, 
um, to just be very sensitive and make sure that people focus on processes and behaviors, although it is going to come down to their individual specific action that they will take with a person, but that could be private. And I always encourage people to, to do something very simple, like get a lunch meeting uh, on the table, get a virtual conversation, because it's not about being right. It's about taking time to understand the other person's position. That's what's critical about this trust battery and building trust. And it doesn't happen overnight. And it's something that you're going to have to continue to work on time and time again. Okay, number six. Brand. Team traits. Perfect, perfect opportunity to step back away from the day-to-day -day business and talk about who you are as a team. And ask your team this very simple question. If... The CEO of the company was describing your team to somebody else. What would he or she be saying about the team? How do you want to be known? We, we're, we're very much in tune with brands when we talk about products. And even personal branding as an individual is gaining a lot of popularity. But what about your brand as a team? Do you deliver on time? Do you have credibility? Are you known to be a high-performance team? Um, do you show up on time? Is your work always solid? Are you customer focused? Are you innovative? What's your brand? Who are you? And when we run this in the workshop, we normally go through, you know, we, we, we go through this in a lot of detail. And in some cases, we've ended up with a tagline and a hashtag for the team. It gives the team an identity. People want an identity. They don't just want to work in a function or a group. What is that team identity? Be intentional take time to talk about the team brand and develop a team brand. It's a fun exercise. Okay, number seven. What now? It's mind-blowing. Mind-blowing, right? What do you do now? You have to develop a cadence of accountability. Now, there's some corporate speak for you. And those words almost make me want to sort of cringe and wince a little bit, right? But I will tell you this, what I've learned about accountability, because I've uh, formed an accountability group, a, a lab that meets every morning at, at 707, and we make commitments. We, we talk about a commitment for work that we're going to do that day, a commitment for a personal, whether it's go for a walk or yoga or something like that, and then a word to declare our mindset for the day. That's what we do. And as a leader, as a team leader, if you do all this work, right, and, and you get back into the office and you harness the power of the restart, then how are you going to keep it going? You can't just run one exercise or do one team meeting and walk away and say it's all good. How do you keep it going? If you've established a team brand, how do you handle the situation where somebody either shows a behavior that supports the team brand that's right in line with it. They're ambassadors of the brand. And what about those people who are not, who are not behaving in line with the brand and where you want the team to go? How are you going to handle that? How are you going to make sure that there's transparency to the tasks and people, people stay on track? For my own personal um, business, I have just launched monday.com. And I got to tell you, I love it. It's so visual. It's so user-friendly. But the most important thing is it gives transparency and visibility to all the tasks. So thinking about that, about what now, how to lead moving forward once we get back into the office, that's going to be super, super critical. So yeah. that's it. That, there are seven leadership strategies that, you can, you can start right now. And what I'd like to know is tell me which ones of all the things we just talked about, which ones resonate with you the most? Which ones you kind of like the most? I'd love to know. Just jump on Menti and tell me. You can put more than one answer in. What, did you really, what, what do you really like? What do you think will, will provide value to you and your team? Yeah, the connection. Absolutely. And the trust battery. Yep. Yeah. Yep, I see that. Yep. Yeah. You know what I find fascinating? I, I love doing the team traits, but people have a hard time uh, getting their mind around this idea of branding for a team. Um, I think we'll, we'll, you know, we'll get there eventually. Yep. 
Connect, yeah, connection. I see that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, connection is important. And there's, you know, there's so many different ways that you could do it. But again, I would reiterate, it's about being intentional. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's about being intentional, about connection. Okay. Um, can we go back to the slide? Next slide, please. So those are my seven leadership strategies. And the next one. That again, it's a compilation of my experience, both in the corporate world and uh, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, my experience in the corporate world, and also uh, my experience running this new business. So at this point, I would love to open it up for questions. Anything that I can answer, um, you can put the questions into Menti. Um, best advice to get others to be more open to change. To really sit down and understand the other person's point of view. Um, it depends on what change, your type of change you're talking about, but it's understanding the, what I found is no matter what situation it is, it's about taking the time to understand that other person's position and then you can start to map the agendas together so they come together. From what you're seeing, what are most companies doing as far as return from, I'm seeing mixed, I'm seeing mixed, um, but I'm also seeing some leaders out there that love command and control that can't wait to get everybody back into the office, but they know somehow that that can't, you know, they can't really do that, so they're struggling with it. Um, I've seen a stat that 59% of employees plan to leave their employer in the next year. I believe that if we don't embrace authentic leadership and do this the right year, the right way, it's the leaders that do this the right way. That's where employees are going to go to, right? It, it, they just are. And then um, how do I be 100% honest with the people who have not performed for an entire year? Well, I would ask you, what does that mean, not performed? What you have a perception of what they have and have not done I would get really, really into understanding what's been going on because remember, you know, we've all been dealing with different things at home and some people might be comfortable sharing that with you. Others may not. You know, I will tell you that years ago when I was in a senior leadership role and I had a sick child at home, I would never tell anybody at work that because I was afraid of being judged and they'd say, oh, well, you know, that's what happens when you hire a woman for a senior leadership role. It's all about taking care of the kids, right? I know that's shocking, but that's, that's, that's reality of it. So I think you have to really spend the time to talk to people and understand this situation. Um, forgotten how to do basic tasks, repeated errors, despite training and customer complaints. Okay. Well, I mean, you just, you, you sit down with a person, you give them an opportunity, you make sure that the expectations are clear, that they've got the right skill set. And if they don't, and if you're getting customer complaints, then you have to make the tough call. If people are, are not performing, and I would, I would use the, the power and the motivation of the team, because I believe in positive motivation and positive accountability, because that's what we do in the accountability lab, right? It's all about helping people reach their goals but we never let it drift over a period of time. So getting this cadence of accountability where you're, you're seeing what's going on and, and having quick check-ins more frequently, I believe is far more powerful and helpful because if you let things drift too far, then you end up in a situation where, okay, you know, now this person's failing, what am I going to do? So you do everything possible in your power to help that person. And if at the end of the day, it's not working, then you you have to have the discussion and you have to cut them out. I mean, you've got, you've got no choice. All right. How to reinforce trust in people is not built yet. Trust, you, know, you have to model trust yourself. You have to trust people. You have to trust others in your organization, even if leaders above you and around you are not modeling it. And sometimes this used to drive my team nuts. Because I would say, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to get into that petty fight or the, this petty argument, or we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt, or we're going to trust them in this situation. You have to give it out and you have to be comfortable in yourself to give it out. 
And I believe that all of these things, you know, are wrapped up in authentic leadership. And it, I mentioned authentic leadership about a million times. I actually have a document called the 21 Traits of Authentic Leadership. If you want a copy of that, uh, feel free. Uh, Arby will put the link in the chat for you. Uh, dealing with the nine to five mentality, not willing to go above and beyond. Yeah. See, this is we're, we're, we're going to be faced with this. Right. So some people like to work nine to five for whatever reason. Right. And somehow, and you have to respect that, right? And you have to get away from the idea that it's about working a certain number of hours or working in a certain place. It's about getting people to feel committed to a team and establishing a team goal. And then there will, the, the power of positive peer pressure, there's a thing called peer pressure and that's what operates in the accountability lab, right? It's, it's positive peer pressure. You have to get people talking with each other in groups about the team and the team goal frequently, often, consistently. That's what great leaders do. They galvanize people around the vision, around the team. So I've shared some things with you today. We can move on. And I hope that you found them helpful. We can, uh, you, you can do these by yourself. You can take some of them or all of them. We have all of these wrapped up in what we call the Gravitas Workshop. I believe now is the time to harness the power of the restart. If you're an authentic leader, step forward right now. This is the time to inspire, motivate, and engage your team. We've never had a better opportunity than to do this right now. If you want me to come in and help you do it, if you want me to run the workshop, I am more than happy to do it. We have the Gravitas Workshop lined up, ready to go. It's a proven concept. You get 35 years of corporate experience and a little bit of that rebellious Welsh farmer's daughter spirit. So with that, I thank you all for attending today. I wish you all the very best on your leadership journey. And for those of you who are wondering about Gravitas, Gravitas is the hallmark of authentic leadership. So I wish you well on your quest for your Gravitas. Thank you.